Welcome to Conversations with Cox and Kielseth. And to be more specific, that is filmmaker Alex Cox and myself, film curator Pablo Kielseth. Alex will join us by phone from his home in Oregon while I sneak away from my office to call him from one of the projection booths used by the International Film Series, which has been screening foreign and independent movies at CU Boulder since 1941. We will keep our chats to about 20 minutes as we discuss whatever movie-related topics grab our fancy. Thanks for joining us. Okay, action. Yes, good to hear your voice again, sir. It's nice to hear yours, too. In fact, uh, God, it's Friday, Friday, 4 o'clock my time, so I guess it might be a little too early for you, but... Not too early for me. Yes, I'm I, having a beer. I have to go out for dinner tonight, <laughs> so I'm going to have to wait until like seven before I can toss back any liquor. Uh -huh. But what are you drinking? Um, you know, it's been a while since I've had Rogue, and I decided to uh, give one of their new hazy IPAs a shot. It's called Bat Squatch. It's got a picture of a giant uh, bat monster. Um, and uh, Well, that's nice. Yeah, it's actually... Uh, it's actually very good. I give it uh, two Excellent. thumbs up. So. Excellent. Yeah. Um, two thumbs up, why? Because Jason's drinking one too and his thumb is up as well. <laughs> you know, Jason, uh, Jason doesn't drink, do you? I don't drink beer. Oh, all right. Yeah. He's, uh, he, he's, uh, he's putting in a, you know, normally he's not available Friday uh, evenings, but he's putting on a special show tonight uh, over at uh, the International Film Series, and uh, he's doing, he's screening Troll 2. That's all him. Has nothing to do with me, so. Troll 2, far out. Yeah. Wow, well, good luck with it. Yeah, uh, we'll see how he does. Uh, thankfully, it's not Halloween proper, because Halloween is usually a very poorly attended night for us, so we oh, yeah. skipped it yesterday. Do you have a, now you don't have any, you're, you're in the woods, so you don't get trick-or-treaters or anything, right? No, actually, that's the one great thing is we never, nobody ever comes to our house under any circumstances, <laughs> so it's really good, even on trick-or-treat night. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, it was a bad night for trick-or-treaters in my neighborhood, too, and, I, and I'm surrounded, but uh, and not in the woods, but, yeah, no one came out. Must have been the bad weather. It's been pretty cold. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I'm surprised at that. I'm surprised you didn't get me, uh, where you are, anyway. Well, listen, I, I normally like to uh, give you a, a, some kind of a heads up on some kind of a topic or something, but um, it's been sort of a crazy week for me, and I didn't, didn't really have a chance to prepare anything. So um, the only thing that's on my radar right now, but I have a feeling it'll somehow dovetail into other realms, is that we are screening at the International Film Series this Sunday. We've got a, a, a matinee show of the director's cut of Vim Vendors Until the End of the World. Which I haven't seen. Oh my God! You must be good, though, huh? If you're showing it. Well, it's actually it's a donor pick, which is to say it's sort of something new I'm doing. Where um, if uh, there's someone out there who's uh, who comes to the IFS and they'd like to see a movie, um, if they will pay for the film exhibition rights, um, then I'll put it on. And as it turns out, uh, the you know over five hour long version of Until the End of the World has not been available apparently. Uh, it's coming out next month, I believe, on Blu-ray with all kinds of special, you know, uh, bonus tracks and things like that. But um, uh, as of right now, and as of our screening of it this Sunday, it is not otherwise available. So this person came to me and said, I'll, I'll pay you for the film exhibition rights if you bring it. And I said, sure, right on. And it's five and a half hours long? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, uh, now, now, the interesting thing about it is that it came out 30 years ago, and it actually did... Um, you know, it, it did have some, it got some of its, uh, it got some things right. It kind of predicted the EU, the internet, and almost the iPhone. So uh, it, it, it's prescient in certain ways, um, and it'll be interesting to revisit it for that reason. Um, but uh, now I, I was trying to remember if we, when I screened a bunch of Vim Vendors film, if you were here, or I can't, uh, and I don't remember that. Um, I don't remember seeing a lot of um, his films at the IFS. I think, no, and if you'd screened, say, American Friend, um, I would have been there, you know, to watch yeah. it. So I think when I was there, it was, must have been a, a gap in his filmography. Um, that's actually, you know, that's, that's one of my favorites of his. Um, 
I do like that one quite a bit. Um, but you guys actually have quite a, you know, you, you both have uh, some things in common. You, you're both, you've both worked with Harry Dean Stanton. Um, That's true, and Dennis Hopper. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you both represent Harry Dean's favorite two films. Um, Paris, Texas, and, and they were made, and those films were made in quick succession, one after yeah. the other. And you're both known <laughs> as directors who have a knack for um, having a good ear and uh, having interesting soundtracks, um, having a lot of um, you know musical uh, sort of in interesting musical tastes uh, that get in there. And you you both were not born in the United States, so you kind of. You sort of bring something, I think, uh, to the table. I think most people weren't born in the United States, even now. <laughs> well, by which I mean, as, <laughs> as filmmakers who've made a, a, a big Im impression on, you know, American movies, though, you, you've, uh, or the American, or I should say the indie film scene or the art house film scene, you know, you've, you've, you've brought this perspective, I think, um, uh, where you can kind of see things maybe a little more clearly uh, since... It could also be that we had that he has two W's in his name and I have two X's in mine and that kind of like just is easier for people to remember. Uh, you know? Well, that's that's possible. Possible. Whereas if your name is Volker Schlerndorf, you've got a more of an uphill struggle to you know stay in the in the in the anglophone mind. Yeah. Now you know when you mentioned um, the American friend, uh, I just I'm just curious because um, I think if I have to. If I have to list like five of my favorite Vin Benders film films, one of them would definitely be Kings of the Road, which is also a long movie. Well, that's a very good uh, film. So isn't you've it? seen yeah, that, one. Yeah. yeah? Oh yeah, I think it's a great film. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Of course, it. Uh, and I love. I mean, Bruno Gantz is in it, and I think Bruno Gantz was such, was such a great actor. You know? Sure, sure. I never saw him not be good. Yeah. Um, did you ever see his uh, his three D film by any chance? No, I don't think so. Um, I saw it at uh, Telluride. It was actually one of the better, uh, Pina, and it was uh, 20, 2011, one of the better 3D films that I've, I've ever seen. And uh, did you ever flirt with, uh, or how do you even feel about 3D? Do you have any... any... Well, it just seems to come every, every sort of 12 or 13 years, there's another C 3D revival, and like for about six months we get barraged with, you know, 3D, it's the latest and the greatest, and then it goes away again. And 11 years pass, and 12 years, whatever the cycle is, and it comes back again, 3D. <laughs> so I'm, I'm resistant to 3D. I, um, certainly, if somebody was going to give me money to make a film in 3D, I mean, I, I could, but uh, it doesn't seem important. Was it something that you didn't gravitate toward as a kid growing up uh, in terms of like creature features or anything like that? No, that's the thing. We never, I never saw a 3D movie when I was a kid. I saw those. We all grew up seeing those pictures of American kids with the glasses yeah. on, you know, in a matinee watching a 3D movie. But, we, but no, I, I'm trying to think. When the, I mean, the first time I saw a 3D movie must have been when I came to the United States. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a formative experience. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, Sad to say. Well, no, I mean, I've got a scarred left eye, which gives me horrible depth of uh, field and also makes me not the greatest uh, person to evaluate uh, 3D in general. Um, but you know, uh, one thing that's interesting is sort of working on 3D and kind of what some people are saying is going to be the next step is uh, uh, the idea of trying to get um, these virtual reality uh, movies off the ground. Um, and I, I don't know if that's going to work, but I, I, uh, but I mean, you and I actually were there in uh, Phil Tippett's uh, studio when he was showing his, uh, was that the first time you'd put on a helmet for, with any? I think so, yes, yes. I think that's the only time I, I have. I can't, don't remember having done it since. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, it was part, I can't remember, was that part of the Mad God? You were in, suddenly you were in the Mad God world. Yeah. You know, you were, you were like among the, among the drones skulking along in Mad Dog land, in, in, in Mad God land. What was interesting to me about that whole experience, because there was like a group of what, there was like 12 or 15 of us there, and Phil seemed to be disappointed that um, most people didn't pick up the uh, audio clues that he wanted um, them to, you know, to use, to, to, to kind of dictate where people move their heads in the virtual reality realm. And what I picked up on is that the guys were the ones who were kind of clueless to the audio cues, 
and the women were the ones who picked up on the audio. How interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. it shows you the difficulty too of like if you're trying to tell a story in this sort of a three-dimensional virtual reality realm, you know, it, how do you how do you sort of sculpt how and where people go to make sure that they, you know, that a story gets, unfolds the way you want it to? So it's a big pain in the butt, frankly. Um, I'm with you on the 2D front. I'm fine with just... Well, I don't know how you could do it with actors. I mean, you could do... You, because you'd have to... It would have to be an animation, so it would contain every possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Or, the, or animate... Or, or, you know, you'd have to animatize the actors so that they would then could, could fit whatever the... In whatever uh, direction the eye went. Yeah. I guess. Now, since you're uh, since you worked with Phil Tippett, uh, is he still? Uh, I meant to ask you earlier, but does he still is he still involved with that whole uh, uh, continuing continuously unfolding Star Wars universe? Uh, does he still do work for them in any way? Or I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's mostly. I think he's been mostly designing like these gigantic rides in China. Yeah, but the. <laughs> You know, I think that that's taken uh, that and doing Mad, Mad God has really been most of his his work of late. I think is that the one where they design clean version of the dirty cities that uh, <laughs> where people can go experience their own city with. I don't know. These are in the cities that that you or I would never have heard of. You know, mm -hmm. they're new cities that have been built around entertainment complexes and massive amusement parks, and he's designed a couple of rides. Yeah for um, these amusement parks. So, and, and Richard Beggs is the sound designer and Dan Wall is doing the music. And so it's, you know, yeah. that I think has been his principal activity, that and Mad God, and which, which also has Dan Wall doing the music and Richard Beggs doing the sound design. Yeah. Now, China's been in the news, of course, with uh, uh, sort of, as, as in terms of the uh, influence and the censorships that they apply. Do you have a sense of whether any of your work is actually out there? I mean, does it are people able to watch, you know, your movies in China or stream them? Do you ever get uh, any sense of that? Or I have never seen any accounting from China. I know that my some of my films, a lot of uh, most of my films have played in Japan, yeah. and some have played in South Korea. But whether any of them have played in mainland China or not, I don't know. So you actually... The Hong Kong Film Festival, I had a film, some film play at the Hong Kong Film Festival years ago, but uh, I don't, don't think I ever had anything that get, got distribution there. You never know, though. Maybe it did. Maybe Repo Man got distributed or Sid and Nancy, you know, back in the day. Do you, do you actually have a... Are you able to, to get a sense of, you know, any of the... Like, do you, do you know when certain of your movies are streaming or like do you, do you get a little check that says this was because of you know it's on Netflix or this is on this or it's on that or I mean um. no sometimes I get the, a distribution from some distribution agency mm -hmm. um, and they say this is from Poland ah. for such and such a film yeah. and such and such a sum you think you know, and again, usually the sums are very small, and occasionally it's like hundreds of dollars. You go, whoa, what, what, <laughs> you know, whoa, what, um, and. But usually it's more, it's like you know, $10 and 73 cents for Sid and Nancy in, in, uh, in Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, but it's interesting. It's, uh, you know, and, and it says something about, I guess, the uh, lifespan of certain movies. Um, we're, uh, you, uh, we just got our uh, 35 print in the office today for um, the film that Ernesto will be showing as part of his Hitchcock class on Monday, and that's North by Northwest. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, I hope it's a nice print. Yeah, well, we th it'll probably be all right. How, where does that fall in your... Do you have uh, any favorite Hitchcock films? Where would you fall? Oh, I really... I think I like best the Hitchcock... You know, I like Psycho and the Birds the best. But I like... And I like um, The 39 Steps as well. Uh-huh. Um, and I mean... And I keep meaning to watch Foreign Correspondent again because that seems like, you know, just remembering bits of it, it sounds very interesting. And I love the dream sequences in Spellbound. Yeah. Um, and North by Northwest is good. It's a good story. It's got lots of adventurous things happening. Yep. You know, it's, yeah, it's good. It's also, and speaking of Definitely. long long films, that's yeah. one of the longer ones too, I think it's... Uh, yeah. Oh, and Rope. I think Rope is good. Yeah, 
Really? It's a cool film. Yeah. We're, uh, we're doing a bonus screening on November 7th of a film called Long Day's Journey in Tonight. And we're actually uh, getting, um, we're, we're going to use a, another venue on campus, the Chem 140 space that Program Council has because they have that 3D Barco projector. And it's a film that apparently <sighs> uses the, the entire last hour of it is one long 3D take. And so it, it comes to mind because we've been talking about 3D. We've been talking about rope, which wow. is one, like, you know, supposedly one continuous, uh, there's a couple, of course, uh, cheats in there, but the idea of one long uh, take, except this is one long take in 3D that is one hour long. So I'm, I'm going to be very curious to see that. That's uh, coming up this November 7th. Oh, um, I should mention oh, yeah, in terms I mean, of timing for people who are listening in, um, we've, we're, we're, we're taping all these, uh, the, these conversations, but they're in the can right now, but uh, Jason said that in the next uh, couple weeks he hopes to be able to put them online. So uh, hopefully people will still be interested in things that have, you know, that are that we're talking about that are in the past to them. But we'll slowly get up to speed uh, when we get it, get things up and running. I think especially uh, the, the, the joy of the IFS is that it's a repertory theater as well as playing new movies. It plays, it plays films out of the past, yep. you know, yep. and that's part of the, uh, the great good fortune of having a repertory theater in your neighborhood. Although everything's getting very complicated because, uh, you know, Disney just, uh, uh, oh, just, uh, what is it? They, they are now owners of a whole chunk of um, studio studio films, and they're um, starting to uh, not, well, you know, just make. They're removing yeah. the, they're removing the Warner Brothers Library from theatrical circulation. Is that right? Uh, is it Warner I, Brothers? It might have been. I thought it was 20th Century Fox. Oh, the 20th Century Fox. Okay, it's not one of them. Yeah. The 20th Century Fox. So they've they are they're removing all of the 20th Century Fox films that they bought yeah. from circulation theatrically, but they'll obviously still be available at the moment as DVDs and Blu-rays and maybe streaming. Yeah, yeah. It's it's complicating uh, the availability of uh, properly projecting movies as they were shot uh, back yes. in the day. Um, yes. And yeah, it's 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 an interesting landscape. Um, those uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a big problem. Yeah, I guess. Uh, are you now? You're you you've had your experience with the big studios, but then you went out and you've you've you know worked with uh, well grassroots certainly on your own. I mean, you raised your own money for Bill the Galactic Hero and uh, uh, a wonderful film made by students yeah. of the University of Colorado. And you, and you got a you got a little bit of help from it from also but from smaller investors, the Three Amigos in uh, Tombstone Rashomon. Um, but um, that's right too. But you've kind of been you've you've sort of seen the whole gamut of it, and uh, it seems like right now you might are you still thinking about getting back in bed with some of the studios for for other projects. Still remains to be seen. I still have no idea. I'm going to have a conversation with somebody at 3.30 today. So in like 13 minutes, I'm talking to somebody who's supposedly spoken to somebody at one of these august institutions. Yeah. Maybe he'll have something to reveal to me, or maybe he won't, uh, about the future prospects of Repo Man 2. Well, we're... But, but right now, I, have, I, I, I know nothing. Yeah. Those of us here who have been, uh, who've, you, we've, know, we've been following your project, and we're, we're wishing you well on that because we'd love to Thank see it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, and hey, and also I got I got the um, uh, Criterion new release of Godzilla movies, early Godzilla movies on Blu-ray, and I guess on a DVD as well. I, I imagine, and. It's like a great big comic book. They've put them all flat in like in a, in like a, in a thing that resembles a, a graphic novel. And you just got you just um, got these. And I just they just came out because I did something for the additional elements. So they sent they sent me a copy of it, and it's really amazing. And and on and in the additional elements, there's a there are like outtakes uh -huh. from uh, special effects from Japanese monster movies and Japanese war movies. And it's just amazing, all the outtakes. Oh, I can't, be I, I, I can't believe we, we had our conversation about Godzilla like three weeks ago. It should have been now. Then you could have filled me in on more of the stuff. <laughs> this just arrived. Yeah. I literally got this last week. 
and it is a very uh, it's a very beautiful package. And what exactly and what what exactly colored. were your contributions to it? Oh, I just I'm interviewed in the uh, about um, the Godzilla movies and and my thoughts about uh, Ishiro Honda, the director. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, and I had some pictures when I went to Japan for the first time to uh, to support a film to support Straight to Hell when it was released there. They they would ask you, you know, where do you do you want to go and see anybody? Do you want to meet anybody while you're here? And of course, everybody goes, I want to meet Kurosawa. <laughs> and people go like, ah, all Western visitors would like to meet Mr. Kurosawa, but Mr. Kurosawa is very busy and cannot meet with you. Anybody else? So then I said, what about Ishiro Honda, director of Godzilla? And uh, and my the guy who's my guide there goes, oh yeah, I, we know we know him. Yeah, yeah, you can go meet him. So I got to go meet Ishiro Honda at his house, and that was very. He was very nice, and we had an interpreter, so we could have a conversation about um, about special effects in films and black and white versus color. Well, that's uh, I mean, right there, I think that that's a huge endorsement for uh, if anyone's listening and likes Godzilla to go check out the. Is it now? Did you get a special pre-release, or is it actually available now? Can people buy it now? I don't know if it's out or not, but I'm sure it will be by the time this thing makes yeah. it to the uh, the archives yeah. <laughs> of the IFS. I'm sure it'll it'll be available right. for like seventy five cents in in the bargain bid. <laughs> well, maybe actually, you know, the opposite <laughs> I find is true. A lot of those Criterion Blu-rays are becoming so rare that uh, uh, Jacob the other day was trying to find In the Mood for Love on Blu-ray and he had to get on eBay and pay $250 for it. Oh, God. But anyway, listen, I think we're coming up on the uh, time limit for your recording equipment on your end, so um, we should probably call it. Oh, wait, but there's one other thing. There's the story about Henry Fonda's <gasps> illegitimate son. Do you have time? Does it, is your Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Tell, no, tell I mean, me. I, I think it does 29 yeah. minutes, so we've still got seven or six minutes. Excellent. Henry Fonda went to Almeria in, and, and uh, Granada in the south of Spain in 1968 to make Once Upon a Time in the West. And supposedly, while he was there, he had relations with somebody in uh, Almeria and left her pregnant. Um, she bore his child, Pepe. And Pepe grew up and became a specialist in the western towns. You know, one of those guys who, you know, falls off horses and does the gunfights. Alex, and you there? Falls off buildings onto, you know, um, you know, things that protect the stuntmen and stuff. Alex. Um, and do you know a movie called Sad Hill? Alex. It's a documentary uh. about the, um, about the cemetery and the good, the bad and the ugly. I'm still on the line. Um, uh, Alex, you dropped out on my end, so I told him that he was also very anxious to tell his little story, which would have been a great one, actually, because it's very inside. Well, he did finish it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> if he finished it, then we can just... <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, Jason was saying that as long as you kept talking, he'll be able to just cut that right in there, man. <laughs> your 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 um, your story because uh, you got cut out on my end. Well, no, uh, no, because you on your end because what he t uses as your end. Did you t did you complete the story on your end? That was it's the ghost of Henry Fonda. He really doesn't want you to, to let let out his secrets. All right, well. Have a good weekend, and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon again. And cut. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks again for joining Alex Cox and myself today. I'd like to thank Jason Phelps for handling the audio and Ted Thacker for letting us use the intro to his song, The Ballad of Slim Cessna for the musical cues that bookend these conversations. Don't forget to go out there and watch movies in a larger than home venue. It's what brings us all together to see movies the way they were meant to be seen, on the big screen as we sit next to strangers, neighbors, and friends. <laughs>